Continuing with lecture three of the remote sensing basics module, we're going to be talking about uh, atmospheric scattering. So what happens to light when it passes through the atmosphere? And then we'll also be talking about what happens to light when it hits the Earth's surface. We can um, we can follow the path of light as it goes from the sun to uh, uh, to pass through the atmosphere, reflect off the ground, pass through the atmosphere again, and then to um, the a sensor could be airborne, could be uh, satellite borne. And the effect of passing through the atmosphere are generally bad. Uh, we've seen the atmosphere block certain wavelengths. It adds noise to images, and it makes it impossible to make some observations. Um, in general, remote sensing scientists would, I mean, aside from the obvious, prefer to work on a planet without an atmosphere. It'd be a lot easier. So let's start talking about the effects of the atmosphere. One is refraction. So refraction is the bending of light rays of contact between two media of different densities. Um, and this occurs because the speed of light changes due to the difference in media density. The index of refraction is the ratio between the velocity of light in a vacuum to the velocity in the medium. And that index is changing as you go through you know, the low density exosphere and thermosphere down into the high density mesosphere, stratosphere, and tropopause. When considering image acquisition from space or high altitudes, what type of error uh, does refraction lead to? Well, it leads to um, you observing an object in a place where it isn't. And this is, is most um, evident when you're looking through air and then water, because you have that difference in, in density. And so objects appear in different locations than they actually uh, uh, are. So that's refraction. The next thing we're interested in is scattering. And the scattering is the diffusion of electromagnetic radiation by particles in the atmosphere. And the kind of scattering you get is dependent on the size and abundance of particles, the wavelength of electromagnetic radiation you're interested in, and the depth of the atmosphere. So, three kinds of scattering. Uh, the first is Rayleigh scattering. Okay. Rayleigh scattering occurs when particles have diameters many times smaller than the wavelength of interest. And if we're looking at the visible, um, the magnitude of Rayleigh scattering is much higher in the blue than it is in the red. Um, and this is the reason why we get um, blue skies. So if you think about the sun, the sun observed in space is white. So it is emitting all the colors of the spectrum um, um, in the visible, as we know. And um, we can separate those out into blue, green, and red, because that's what our eyes are seeing. Um, blue is going to be very highly scattered by the atmosphere. Uh, and green and red, less so. so because the blue is being scattered off in all directions, um, we get, we observe the green and red light from the sun as the color of the sun. Green and red together, that's gonna give you um, the observation of the color yellow. The blue light is scattered off um, as it interacts with particles in the atmosphere and then is re-scattered back um, towards objects on the surface of the Earth. And of course, it could be scattered again, but eventually um, you're gonna see a large fraction of that blue light being re-scattered uh, 
in the direction that you're observing. Second type of scattering, me scattering, which uh, is why pollution or smoke from fires make sunset prettier, sunsets prettier. So it occurs when particles have diameters about the same time, uh, same size as the wavelength. It depends on the amount of smoke and dust that's in the atmosphere. And the more uh, particles there are, um, they're gonna scatter the shorter wavelengths. So it's gonna scatter blue and green, um, and only the reds are going to be left. Um, so um, that is invisible. The only thing that's gonna be left is red. So you're gonna get reddish sunsets, um, and you also see um, reddish moons when you have um, either a lot of pollution or more commonly in this area, when you have forest fires. Third, we have non-selective scattering. And this explains why clouds are white and high beams don't work in fog. Um, it occurs when particles um, with, have diameters much larger than the wavelength. And predominantly, we're talking about um, some kinds of smoke, but mostly water vapor, okay? And it's non-selective scattering because it scatters all the wavelengths uh, equally. So clouds, um, at least nice puffy clouds, um, not very deep clouds like you get with uh, convective cells, but when you have nice puffy clouds, they are scattering off all wavelengths of light equally. And of course, when you have all wavelengths of light being scattered off equally, you're um, going to see the color white. And so this happens with clouds, and it also happens with fog as you're driving down the road. Um, so you can't see very clearly because you're observing both the road and the backscattered light from fog. So that's scattering uh, in the atmosphere. There's also absorption of electromagnetic radiation that occurs when the atmosphere prevents or attenuates uh, transmission of radiation or its energy through the atmosphere. There are three principal absorbers in the, in the atmosphere. One of them is ozone, which absorbs high energy photons, um, which are uh, short uh, wavelengths, so less than 0.24 uh, micrometers, so we're talking about ultraviolet. Um, these are harmful to plants and animals. Um, uh, it's approximately uniform, that is ozone is approximately uniform in the high atmosphere. Um, it's actually dangerous in the troposphere at the bottom of the can, uh, the bottom of the atmosphere because it is harmful for to plants and animals. Uh, the next big absorber is carbon dioxide that's going to absorb in the mid and far infrared. It's approximately uniform in the lower atmosphere. Um, and then water vapor, uh, which absorbs mid and far or thermal infrared. It's highly variable in the lower atmosphere. So this diagram, you know, x-axis is wavelength in micrometers and the y-axis is solar radiation, contrasts in the darker color, the solar radiation at the top of the atmosphere and then the solar radiation that's going to be able to be transmitted through um, to sea level. And so it, you can see where the different um, constituents of the atmosphere, ozone, water, and um, CO2, what wavelengths they tend to absorb. In remote sensing, we have the concept of atmospheric windows. And so these are portions of the electromagnetic uh, uh, radiation spectrum that are transmitted perfectly or nearly so through the atmosphere. So anywhere on this diagram where the amount of radiation at sea level is high relative to the amount of radiation at the top of the atmosphere, those are atmospheric windows. Here's another diagram of them. 
Here we're showing atmospheric absorption from zero to 100%. And this gives you some other, um, other portions of uh, other constituents in the atmosphere. Um, and you can see again, at the bottom I've labeled visible and infrared. Um, uh, the visible is, is generally an atmospheric window. Um, the infrared, as I spoke about in one of the early lectures, is highly variable. And so we need to um, place our bands very carefully in order to be able to make good observations in the infrared. Now, it's important to note with atmospheric windows that we're talking about a range of wavelengths. Sometimes people get confused and they think, oh, atmospheric windows, um, these are um, areas in the atmosphere that um, transmit light. No, some people get confused and think they're times, ranges of times where light can be transmitted through the atmosphere. No, again, um, these are um, ranges of wavelengths where light can be transmitted through the atmosphere. And of course, one of the most important um, areas of absorption is the ozone layer. And you can see that on the left end of this, uh, this diagram at right, that, you know, the shorter uh, wavelengths are almost completely occluded by uh, the atmosphere. And it was this, this effect that allowed us to map the hole in the ozone layer was actual um, mapping of um, the quantity of uh, um, wavelengths, uh, light in the wavelengths, um, below 300 that were being reflected rather than being absorbed by ozone. 